Yeah, it makes me realize how old I am when Scott's got gray hair. I'm like, oh Lord. It is an honor and a privilege to be with you. And Scott was nice to me. I'm going to be nice to him. I'm not going to tell you any stories. I will tell you this. In the youth group and stuff, Scott was the one that I leaned to and looked to when I needed an honest answer. Uh, Not so from the others. They were always up to something. I remember one trip in particular. We were in an old school bus. It's what we had, and I was driving the youth to an event. And one of the rules we had was, it was an old school bus, and it just burned oil like crazy. The rule was, when you got back from a trip, you checked the oil so that somebody leaving didn't have to get messed up before they left. Well, we were riding down the road, and of course, the students, they all sit toward the back. And I am sweating my brains out. The heat at the front was unbelievable. I I remember calling Scott up front, Scott, is it unusually hot? I knew he would give me a right answer. Is it unusually hot right here? He said, it's burning up. I remember we found a gas station. I pulled off. I had to check the oil in that big old bus. I'm climbing up on that thing. There's not a drop of oil in it. I poured four quarts of oil in it and prayed the Lord let it start. Well, you see, be careful what you pray. Finish the prayer. It started. That's what I ask. We got to the next red light and when I stopped, it stopped and it locked up. It didn't budge. We had to call his dad and another friend who came and picked us up, drove us to where we were headed. They came back. They ended up having to get a tow truck. Scott was always the trustworthy one, and I appreciated that very much. I bring you greetings from Global Servants, our president, Travis Rutland, uh, the founder, Dr. Mark Rutland. Uh, To give you an idea of the lineage and stuff here, Scott may have been in my youth group. I was in Dr. Rutland's youth group right about the time of the Civil War. That lets you know how old he and I are. Um, But I also bring you greetings from brothers and sisters across the world. In Thailand, their greeting would be, Swati Kap. That's if you're a male. A male ends the phrases with Kap. Females, you end the phrase with Ka. Well, my first trip ever, Dr. Rutland's daughter Rosemary was, was the international director at the time. We made our way to Thailand, and I said, how do, how do I say hello? How do I, how you say Swati Kai, you say Swati Kai. She drilled that in my head. So my first time to speak to them, I stood up and I said Swati Kai, and they erupted into laughter. All of those girls just busted out laughing. And the resident director, Judah Pond, is going, no, 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 no. That's where I learned the difference of male and females. Speaking there. So they would say, Swati Kap, Sabadi Mai Kap. And you're supposed to end every phrase with Ka Kap, but so many times in that, their answer would be Sabadi. Let me hear you say that. Sabadi. So I would come to you and say, Swati Kap, Sabadi Mai Kap. And you would say, Amen. Very good. That's hello. How are you? And you said, I am good. In Ghana, they have a formal greeting of Wahunta Sain. And I, I, I love it in Tree. Wahunta Sain. And the answer is Aye Pa. <clears throat> and what I love about that is the longer you hold Pa, the better you are. If you say Aye Pa, nah, I'm all right. Aye Pa. I'm good. I'm good. So let's try that. Sweaty Cup. The informal greeting as friends they would say et es sane. and, and their, their language almost sounds gruff et, et es sane. sounds like they're mad at you et es sane. and your answer would be boko let me hear you say that boko et es sane. Boko. turn to your neighbor and say I didn't know you spoke in tongues <laughs> but I bring you greetings from them uh, as they are praying for me and praying for you this morning. Uh, uh, 
If you're in Thailand, it's already evening. They're 12 hours ahead of us. Uh, those little girls are getting ready. If they're not already in bed, they're getting ready for bed because they will be in school bright and early. They get up at 5.30 in the morning. We presently, we deal with human trafficking, and that's why we have a girls' home in northern Thailand. We have a girls' home in, Kumasi, in uh, just outside of Kumasi in uh, Anwamaso, Ghana. Um, we deal with the human trafficking, and we're not in the aspect of removing girls from the trade. That's extremely dangerous, and it also requires psychiatrists and psychologists and all things. What we're trying to do is prevent the scars from ever happening. And so we take the girls in. Most of our girls in Ghana are, are straight-out orphans. Uh, but in Thailand, we have a mixture of that. Um, in, in neither place is education free. And so every girl has a sponsor and we supply them a place to sleep whether we have the home. Uh, for most of them, it's the first time they've slept in a bed. Uh, most of them, it's either bamboo mats or dirt floors. Um, we feed them, clothe them, take care of all their needs. Um, and then we pay for them to go to school. As long as they're in school, they can stay at House of Grace. And so we now have uh, about 105 girls in uh, Thailand. We've been there for over 35 years. I'm proud to say we've graduated uh, three lawyers. I do not know how many teachers or nurses. I, I can't even begin to. Uh, we have business women that have come through the House of Grace who are now in business for themselves and their families in Thailand, in Australia, in Japan, Switzerland, and the United States. Those are the ones I know of off the top of my head. Um, we've got girls who have now encountered uh, aspects of the world. These are mostly hill tribe girls. Uh, they're not Thai citizens. We help them get their citizenship, if at all possible. The Thais do not recognize them as being part of the hill tribes. They're not recognized as Thai citizens. And without citizenship, you can only go so far in your career in life. You'll never, there are some jobs you cannot have if you're not a Thai citizen. There's governmental help that you cannot receive unless you're a Thai citizen. And so we work to help get them citizenship. We're in the process now of about a $750,000 worth of building between a new dorm that will increase our capacity there, a new kitchen where we can actually close the doors and the animals don't walk through it, uh, and all like that, and we can better serve the number of girls that we have. In Ghana, we house 35 girls. Uh, that's, we've just built a new two-story dorm, and that's the capacity of that dorm. Uh, that's what the government will allow us to have. Um, we have been there just over 10 years. We've had our first high school graduates. Uh, it's two of them. I was there when the first original eight girls came. Um, I came back with the report that this was not going to work because in the eight girls that we had, they came from tribes in the north. None of them spoke the same language and none of them spoke the language of the director. It took them two months to learn eat. Uh, one of them even finally was able to say to to the director of the house that in school, if they would speak my language, I might could learn this. Uh, and this learning to eat, it was fascinating because uh, Miss Comfort, who was Sammy Adano, our international director at the time, it's his wife, she oversaw the girls, and um, she took them to have ice cream. Now think about this. They're from villages that don't have electricity, they might have a well, probably not. They draw water from a river or a lake. Uh, they had never encountered anything really cold. And they went to eat ice cream. And one of the girls touched the... And, mm -mm -mm. and they just stared at it. And Miss Comfort was like, try it, try it. Just come on, come on. Finally, one girl, she, she's the, the bigger one of them. She finally took another one in a headlock and shoved ice cream in her mouth <laughs> and force-fed about three of them. Now they love ice cream. They absolutely love it. They, um, another interesting thing we found out with our girls, 
Um, they were, most of them, when they come to us, are malnourished and, uh, and all like that. Um, our girls now are hef- hefty. We can identify our girls at the school because they're big in the rest. Because they get three meals a day and they're good and they're healthy and they're eating real food for some of the first times in their life. One of the things I'm proud of with that is in, well, in Thailand, the university system is one in which is not free, as I said, and only a certain number of hill tribe people are allowed to go and only a certain number of females are allowed in university. I'm proud to say at one time we had 20 girls in the university system. As I said, we've graduated three lawyers and I don't know how many nurses and teachers now. Uh, And what I'm proud of too is that when our girls graduate from high school in Thailand, they will speak their tribal language, they will speak tree, they will speak English, and many of them will be taking Chinese because they're so close in the north. In Ghana, when they graduate, they'll speak their tribal language, They'll speak tree, the language of the tribal language of the region where they are. They'll speak English, which is the national language of Ghana because it was a British crown colony. And then most of them learn French because every country that surrounds them speaks French. And so I'm very proud of what we're in the midst of and what we're doing and how we're moving and growing. In Ghana, we also have a school of about 500 students. And we also have in in West Africa region in Ghana, Togo, Benin, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Ghana, we have about 55 churches and pastors in those regions. We also dig wells and we build sanitation stations. And I'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But I'm proud of what we're doing and I thank you for the support that you've given. I know many of you know Dr. Rutland and have prayed for us and have been in support of us. And I thank you for all of that. Uh, Dr. Rutland also teaches the National Institute of Christian Leadership which if you are interested, you can see me afterwards, but we will be holding that here in Cartersville uh, starting in September. If anybody's interested in that, please see me and I'll talk more about it. But that, with that, let's go to God's Word. In Exodus chapter 4, Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. I I love scripture and honesty. Who grabs a snake by its tail? Are you kidding me? I, I like the idea that he fled. But to come back and take this thing by its tail, good grief. So he stretched out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord furthermore said to him, now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand in his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and then he took it out. Of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even those two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made, your, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth, and teach you what you are to say. But he said, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would just make your word come alive in our midst this day, that you would speak to us and give us ears to hear, that we might hear your word, not the foolishness of a man's heart, but your word, O Lord. And then give us eyes to see you in a fresh new way. But most of all, 
Touch our hearts that we might receive all that you have for us this day. For we come before you in Jesus' holy, precious, and powerful name. And all the children of the King said, Amen. Amen. Well, we've stepped into a new day. It's not new, but it's new. Because in one sense, every day is new. Every element of it is new. But, but as you talked about, two years, two years as a global Methodist church, two years with a new pastor, two years of change in the midst of that and the years prior to that and all of the turmoil that went with it, all of the questions, all, I, I was there. I pastored in the United Methodist Church for 40 years. I understand that in the midst of all that craziness, well, it's not isolated to the church. Look at the world in which we live. Look at the, the, the situation which we find ourselves in the United States as we move into this election, and I am not going there. We all know the insanity of this moment and all of the things that are taking place and all the push and the pull and this. Look at the chaos in the world. Wars and rumors of war. They'll be there and constantly there. And all the things that, what, what do we do? What do we do? Moses was raised in Egypt. Killed a man, fled. Was now hiding in the wilderness. Now married. Tending flock. Kind of safe and secure. Just let me get through the day. How many of us live that way? Think about it for a moment. Do we just live to try to get through the day? That's not what God intended for us. He said, I've come to give life and that more abundantly. That, but, but Moses just went, and then all of a sudden, he's got a burning bush, and he says, I've got to go take a look at this. It's not consumed. He should have known something was up when he saw a bush that was, that was burning that wasn't burning. And he got there and God spoke to him and God called him and he was like, N but no, not me. I can't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going back there. He said, yeah, you are. I need you to set my people free. He said, yeah, but what if they won't believe me? He said, what's that in your hand? Throw it down. Like I said before, throw it down. Who grabs a snake by the tail? That joker will turn around and bite you. It's crazy. He said, take it by the tail. And the insanity of it is that Moses did it. But Moses obeyed. And it became a staff. And then he talks about the first sign and the last sign. And notice that when he talks about the first sign, he says, put your hand in your bosom and it will become leprous. It, it was like the, the, the land in which they lived and, and all the things that was happening. And, and the children of Israel were in bondage and they were slaves and they were leprous. They were outcast. They were also just there. And he says, do it again. And this time when he pulls it out, it's restored. And God is basically saying, look, I'll restore my kingdom. If they won't believe the first, maybe they'll believe the last and realize I've come to give that life and I will set you free. I will make it as real and as clean as ever. Moses says, can't you send somebody else? How often do we say that? How often do we just simply say, God, can't you, can't you use somebody else? You see, we have a, we have a new future. Dr. Rutland talks about it all the time, and he doesn't mind me sharing some of those stories. But one of his famous lines to all of us that listen to him growing up, the next phone call can change your life. The next phone call can change your life. Dr. Rutland had been in Africa. He spent the time in Africa, came home. It was around Christmas. He was at home. They were preparing a dinner, I think, that evening. Phone rang. He answered it. He said, the voice on the other end says, this is Dr. Paul Walker of the Mount Perrin Church of God. I would like to tell you. And he immediately said, Ronnie, get off the phone and quit that and hung up. He thought I was doing a prank call. He hung up and 
phone rang again. He picked it up. He said, no, hang on for me. This is Dr. Paul Walker of the Mount Perrin Church of God. And he... And from that moment on, he left from preaching on the hood of a Land Rover in the middle of nowhere, Africa, to standing on the largest Pentecostal church in the United States at the time. And God opened doors that he never dreamed of or imagined. The next phone call can change your life. My wife, Darlene, is here with me this morning. She, let me tell you how good a pastor's wife she is. Uh, my last two years of serving, I was in Thompson at the uh, first church there. And we did three services a Sunday. Do you know, this woman went to all three services. And listen to me. She listened to me preach three times every Sunday. Can you imagine that? Some of you are going to go out of here and say, why did we listen to him today? She did it three times. I thought it because I was that good. And she finally told me the truth. I came to see everybody else. <laughs> but she and I have met a new good friend. He's become a dear friend. He's in his 80s. Come to find out, he owns a restaurant in Buford. And come to find out, we actually kind of grew up in the same area. He was a meat cutter in Decatur near Oak Grove Methodist Church where I was in Dr. Rutland's youth group. And we knew some of the same people and the same stuff. Well, we hit it off. Mr. Buddy and I have been spending time together periodically and talking and, and it's been exciting. Mr. Buddy said, and the next event can change your life. He was a meat cutter at Oak Grove. And so uh, one day about four Hispanic guys came in. They had restaurants and said, our normal meat uh, guy has not got the meat for us. Hadn't delivered. Have you guys, we need it like now. And he said, sure. And he cut it for them what they wanted, got it to. They decided that that meat was so much better than what they'd been getting. They came back to him. And they came back to him and they came back to him. And they came back to him. And then they finally said, can you get the other stuff for us? Long story short, Mr. Buddy no longer is a meat cutter. His main business is that he supplies all of the tortillas, the vegetables, the meat, and everything for about 250 Mexican restaurants in the southeast. He does a tractor-trailer load of tortillas a week throughout the southeast. This restaurant, he always wanted to run, have a restaurant, is his hobby. I'm like, the best steak I've ever had. Then in the midst of that, he says, this is my hobby. And now he and his wife have opened a Mexican restaurant next door, right next door as a part of his hobby. The next phone call, the next encounter, the next situation can change our lives if we'll just pay attention to it. That we don't know what the next person entering the doors of this church may be and what they may bring. We don't know who is sitting here among us and what they may do to change the world around us. It's why I absolutely love children's and youth ministry. I absolutely love it because you don't know who's there. You don't know who's there. With Scott, I was not surprised when I found out he was going into the ministry. That didn't surprise me. Ron Compton surprised me. That was another boy in the youth group. When they said he was going to the ministry, I want to say, are you sure? <laughs> Is it prison ministry from inside? <laughs> what, are we, what are we doing here? They didn't, in the midst of that, we, we don't know who they are. I can remember when I told Dr. Rutland that I felt called to preach. He just, he apologized later, he just looked at me. Didn't seem excited or anything. Oh, okay. Later on, we were together. I then, when he uh, moved from Oak Grove and went to Midway Methodist Church, I went with him to lead the choir and, and uh, the youth and then was like his assistant when he began traveling full time. I traveled with him, leading the singing in the little Methodist churches all over North Georgia. And then I pastored for 40 years. I ended up being on the board of Global Servants, then most recently chair of the board, and resigned from the board to become an employee. 
We never know what the next encounter may mean, what it may do. So we sit here and say, how, what? Some of the most important words that God says to Moses at that moment was, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What do you have? We spend so much of our time saying, God, if I had. What, that's the whole thing of the lottery. Now, don't get me started on the lottery. I don't like the lottery. That's why I don't play the lottery. But Reader's Digest sweepstakes, I wish I could win that. I, I can't even imagine getting that much money at one time. I've even told God, if you will let me have that, I won't tithe. I'll give you half of it. I've never won it. Because God whispers in my ear and says, yeah, but you already got plans for the other half. And it ain't about me. So, wait, 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 wait. So we always, what if? It, God, if I had this. God, if I had that. God, if I could do this. God, if you would just do that. God, if you, yeah. What do you have in your hand? Moses had a staff. Once he picks it up, it is then called the rod of God. The rod of God. The girls in Thailand and Africa, in the midst of all that they do, getting an education is beyond anything that they ever thought possible. And now they have future and hope. I love watching the little girls come in. They come in uh, the first part of May, and I was just there in June. And the new little girls, I'm the biggest thing they've ever seen. For many of them, like one of the girls in Africa, that first group of girls, when I was there October a year ago, one of the girls had come back to see me. I was the first white man she had ever seen and encountered. She told me about it. And they had no hope. But now at the House of Grace and encounters with, with us and different things, they, they have a future, a hope, they have a dream. They have, uh, as I said, they speak multiple languages. When, in this most recent trip, we had a girl who the state sent to us. We have a good relationship with the state in both countries. And the state sent this girl to us. Judah Pine said when she came, she was not planning on staying there. She was going to be there about, oh, three months, four months maybe. Uh, the state had taken her away from her family. She had watched her brother-in-law kill another family member with a hammer. She's 14 years old, and she watched it. And the state took her away, and she only planned to be there four months because she just wanted to get her kind of act together, and then she was going to go try to find a minimum wage job at 14, and she was worried about her niece who was still in that family. So, as I said, every girl has a sponsor. We like for our sponsors to, to build a relationship. We ask them to commit to like three years if possible, although we know things change and situations change. But for this girl, uh, Faye, who is our advocate, thought we don't want to give a new sponsor somebody that's going to be leaving in four months. And so she got one of our older sponsors and said, would you mind picking this girl up for a little bit? He happened to be on this trip with me. And we got to meet this girl and see this girl. Now she's been there four weeks at the House of Grace. And at our closing night of worship, we were leaving the next day. Judah Pond, who is our national director, gave the girls opportunity. We spoke, but then she gave the girls the opportunity to speak. And this girl raised her hand. And when Judah Pond called on her to come forward to the microphone, now, we've got 105 girls. Judah Pond looked at me because this girl had hardly said anything much. She had begun to speak with friends and stuff like that. And as she began to speak to them in her tribal language, Judah Pond told us later that she began to share not the details of her story, 
but that she was afraid to come. And she had gone through some horrible things. And she had not planned on staying here long. But she said, for the first time in my life, I found a family. I found some people who love me. I found a home. And I plan on staying here and finishing school. And I want to make a difference. She's also talked with Judah Pond about getting her niece to our home, and they're trying to make that happen. But this is a girl that, like the sponsor said, he had spent some time with her, said from what we saw was a girl with no hope who now has hope. Who now has hope. You don't know what you may mean in the lives of those around you if you just pay attention to who you are, what you've got, and what you've got in your hand. And what you have in your hand through Christ Jesus is hope. A hope that we can make it through this. A hope that we'll survive this. A hope that God is more than conquerors. The the hope of His presence, His power in our lives. And this little girl now has hope. And this little 14-year-old girl, I cannot wait to see what happens to her in the next several years. She's a very good student. We already know that. And it's going to be absolutely amazing. I look at our staff. We don't... We don't send Americans over to run the house. We hire indigenous people. We're building buildings there. We hire indigenous people. We want to help them. We want to help their culture. We want to help their their economy. We want to help them. And when I look at our staff at the House of Grace, those are girls who grew up there. I'm looking forward to the day in Ghana in which we grow up enough girls that they begin to run the House of Grace there. That Judah Pond, who uh, who is our national director, she was one of the first girls at the House of Grace 35, over 35 years ago. She was one of the little girls that was raised there, and she's now raising little girls, making a difference. That little girl from a, tribe, uh, a tribal village came to a, a rented flat in downtown Chiang Rai with a group of eight of them who has now been in the process of raising hundreds of girls. And when I look at our staff, one of them, golly, I remember, I've been going since 2001. I remember when she was this big. If you looked up brat in the dictionary, her face might be right there. Oh my gosh, she was into stuff. She was always doing stuff. She was always up to stuff. She was Mischievous was her nature. She is now one of the top leaders in the House of Grace loving on these girls. She also knows all their tricks. What do you have in your hand? It's not about if anymore. It's about what. What are we doing with what we've got? But what are we doing with what we got if we obey God's call? Pick up the snake by the tail. Really? Really? When I felt God's call in my life, whoa, It was horrifying and terrifying to me because, you see, when I was in seventh grade, they put me on nerve pills. I I couldn't stand to be around people. I was terrified of people. I was scared to go to school. I was scared to go anywhere. So when God called me to preach, I don't know how you talk to him. You're nuts. You have lost your mind. If you think, you see, we didn't have real computers in those days. I wanted to do electronics. I wanted to... I loved the church. I loved being at the church. That was the only friends I had. And I I loved being there, but I wanted to do sound. I wanted to do something that didn't talk back. Now computers, they talk back to you, so that that doesn't work anymore. But in the midst of that, I was terrified, and I felt God's call to preach, and I was miserable, and I finally said, okay, okay. I remember when Dr. Rutland asked me to come be the choir director at Midway Methodist Church. I had just entered college. I was going to Reinhardt College, and by the way, I entered on special permission. I I entered on probation. Let's let's just put it that way. I was number three in my class at high school, third from the bottom. (laughs) 
Dr. Rutland went to the president of Reinhardt College, a, a Methodist junior college at the time, and he talked with Dr. Jernigan for I don't know how long in his office till finally Dr. Jernigan agreed just to get Dr. Rutland out of the office. Is there anything else you want? Oh, yeah. He's got a single mom, and he needs the money to come to school. I need you a scholarship. He said scholarship. We don't scholarship probationary members. He's on probation coming in. I've given you that. And they worked out a work-study program and all like this. But I remember when he asked me to come be that choir director, I said, Doc, you know I can't read music. I mean, you got music up here. That means absolutely nothing to me. He said, look, here's the thing in a little country choir. Number one, act like you know what you're doing. I don't. He said, number two, sing louder than anybody else. And son, you ain't got a problem with that. And so I said, okay. I served there for three years with him. And in those three years, I was challenged one time by the choir. God did give me a gift that if I can hear it, I can sing it. My piano player was a year younger than me, and I was 18. My piano player was a year younger than me. I would meet her an hour before choir practice and make her play everything. I learned the metrical index of the hymnal and all this stuff. And I said, play it for me, and we listened to it. And I'll never forget one choir practice. I was challenged one time. High school band student who could read music. She raised her hand and she said, Brother Ronnie, that is not how this is written. Now, they couldn't see my piano player. They were in kind of a hole and she was down here and I looked at her and she going, he's right, he's right. I said, you know what, sweetheart, you're exactly right. But this is called creative license. This is the way the congregation will be familiar with it. It stays in rhythm and we'll just sing it that way. She said, okay. I never had another question, another question, because I was louder than the rest of them. I will tell you, <laughs> it's kind of like this. My next job in the church was to go to Prospect Methodist Church with uh, Lawrence Lockett to be his choir director. I said, Lawrence, what's happening with your choir director now? I still can't read music. So, oh, she just doesn't want the responsibility of directing choir. She's going to be your accompanist. I said, mm, oh, no. It's Renee. So I met with Renee, and I said, Renee, you need, you need to know something. I don't know how to read me. What? You what? What are you and lock it up to? I said, I, I don't know what he's up to, but I'm trying to do this. I said, but if you can play it, I can sing it. Will you work with me? And she said, well, somebody's got to. <laughs> she and I become good friends. And she took care of me for another year while I was there. The question is, what do you have in your hand? He says, Moses, I can't do this. I can't. I've never been able to speak. He says, who, who created your mouth? I will give you the words to speak. I will speak for you. I will speak through you. If we obey and step out, God will do wonders through us. One of my favorite stories in the New Testament is Peter walking on the water. I love it because he sank. I love it because of the honesty of it. Jesus is walking. They say, if that's really you, tell me to come out. He said, well, come on, big boy. And so Peter, the biggest one, the loudest one, didn't hesitate, stepped out, starts walking on the water. The storm is raging around him. He looked down. Uh-oh. Took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. What I love about that passage, that whole story, is Jesus didn't look down on him and say, good luck getting back to the boat. Hope you make it. Sometimes we feel like that. But the reality is, Jesus reached down, took his hand, and Peter walked on the water back and got in the boat. James and John, you know, they were the sons of thunder. They were giving him a hard time about it. I imagine Jesus looked up and said, you didn't get out. And I, I heard a phrase years ago, and I've never forgotten it. I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat rider any day. Think about that. I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat rider any day. That I'd rather trust God and risk it and step out, because if I sink, He'll pick me up. 
He'll bring me back. But God can't do anything with frozen. He can fix a mistake. He can fix a problem. But He can't do anything with frozen. I'm not doing anything till you do it. And we wonder why God's not doing anything in the life of our church. We wonder what's happening. And the reality is the next phone call can change your life. Let me close with this. There are those who stepped out and trusted God. Mr. Buddy that I mentioned before. Mr. Buddy has become a great supporter of Global Servants. He had heard about one of our trips. We, Tyler, a man that I work with, he and I had gone to Ghana and we came back and he wanted to know how it went. And we had gone to a village called Bimsi up in the north. And I was so impressed. Part of the show to schoolhouse, they had a hundred and something kids in three rooms that were a mud hut. We had helped them put a tin roof on it, but a tin roof in a mud hut in Africa is called an oven. They had no windows, had a door. In one of the classrooms, the students had just busted out the wall so the air might come through. But that meant the rain came in and everything else. They also, they had a blackboard, but there were no desks and no chairs. They sat on the floor. If they had a few, they scattered them about. But then as we made our way through this village, we came to a block building that was about four classrooms with a tin roof. The pastor of that village, one of our pastors, had decided they needed a better school. So through the church, they built this building. The only thing we helped was the tin roof on that building as well. There was no water in that village and no electricity in that village. There was a gentleman who was a, a Muslim near the school that had a well, but in the hottest times of the year, they were not allowed to use it because it would dry up. And the pastor showed us in the distance. It was about five miles in the distance. He says, that's where the river is. And that's where uh, the households go to gather water and bring back for their homes. And sometimes with school, we will take the kids and we will take them to the river where there's water and shade from the trees and we'll do school there. One of the things that we had begun to build in Ghana was also sanitation stations, chemical outhouses. When Travis, uh, our president, came up with that idea, I thought, really? We're going to go to Africa and build outhouses? They love them. They gave us a report after many villages we'd built those in. They said, we've done two things. Between the wells and the, and the, and the sanitation stations, we've greatly reduced disease. Typhoid, many other diseases. We've greatly reduced it because of the sanitary condition. They said, the other thing that we've done is we've reduced the number of deaths by snake bite and big cat attack. Huh? said, yeah, they're not wandering out of the jungle at night to go to the bathroom. They're not wandering out in the bush and can't see the snake that's there. We've greatly reduced the deaths. We even had the government contact us and said, we hear what you're doing and building. They had had all their student teachers getting ready for initiation to be teachers in, in throughout Ghana. And they were at a certain place. And one of the young men that was going to be a teacher went out into the woods with snake bit and died. The government contacted us and said, we know uh, what you've been doing and we, want this, we do not want this to ever happen again. Will you build one right here at this location for us? One of the things I loved is that we didn't have to have a meeting. We didn't have to have a committee. We didn't have, no, we said yes. We took what we had in our hands and we even told Sammy and our directors and stuff there, Sammy and Dan, we said, stop whatever you're doing and go build that one right now. Well, we told Mr. Buddy about Bimsey. No water, no electricity, nothing. And how the school was, they were just so hot. This, the block building had a little bit of ventilation, but not much. Mr. Buddy says, I want to help with a well. What does a well cost? I said, well, the well may cost somewhere near $12,000. We now found it to be cheaper at times. He said, well, I can't give all that right now, but, but here's like $8,000. And he gave me a check that night. He said, here's $8,000. I, I want you to see to it, get him a well. 
So Tyler and I went to work and we got in touch with them. We sent the guys out to drill the well. We were just going to supplement it. And they found the water table was pretty close. So it cost minimal amount to dig that well and they hit water. There was enough money left over that they built sanitation stations so that the kids, when they came to school, had a place to go to the bathroom. Oh, there was enough money left that we brought electricity into the village and they now have, every classroom has a light bulb and has an electric socket that they can plug a fan into and we bought them fans. Because one man who had been a meat cutter simply took what he had in that moment, obeyed God, and made a difference. Took a village from the edge of the Stone Age to water, sanitation, and electricity. So this morning I ask you, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What are you doing with what you've got? Listen. God says, I've come to give life and that more abundantly. That doesn't just mean in our lives. It means corporately. It means throughout our community that we are to be the blessing that God has called us to be. And that's why I love what you're doing with Vacation Bible School. When I heard that announcement, I thought, I was right on target. It's right on target. Let's reach out to these kids. Let's love on them. Let's share with them the love of Jesus who knows who they are. And there may be one of them who says, I've watched some terrible things in my life, but I'm going to, I have hope now. I'm going to finish. And there are those of you who've made it happen. You've heard the call of God and you make it happen. And I urge you, when you do that picnic, flood them with love and grace. Surround them. Be here and celebrate what it is God has done and is doing in their very midst. For we are the church of the living God. And if there's hope for our nation, it is from the life of the church that we'll hear God's call, obey God's call, and pay attention to His Word. To all of it. Not the select parts we like, but to all of it. That if we hear His call and obey, His blessings are there, not just for us, but for the generations to come. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, your love. We thank you for all that you are and all that you have for us. Be yourself in this place and finish this in our hearts. And Father, we want to glorify you and glory in you. Lord, just be yourself right here, right now. You know the need of every heart, every life. Father, there's some things that we need to lay before you to get rid of. What do we have in our hands? There's some things that we got to let go of. Lord, I remember that young man at Youth Advance who came to the altar and laid knife after knife after knife on the altar. Saying, I've been playing with these things and been looking at how I can kill somebody. And he laid them on that altar that night. Lord, there's some things that we need to get rid of, but there are also some things that we need to say, Lord, I want you to use this for your glory. Give us the courage to surrender that unto him. Father, give us the courage to ask for that which we need. Now, in just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And as we do, this altar is open. I invite you to come and let go of and receive all that God has for you. I ask you, what's in your hand? And what are you doing with it? Father, finish this now. Give us the courage to ask for that which we need. As we come before you now in Jesus' holy, precious, and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Would you come as we stand and sing together?